This week on Arizona Illustrated, two bears, two approaches to masks. People have a certain amount of culpability on their own. I wanted to go with education first. Search and rescue during the monsoon rains. I want to know where the person is, how much imminent danger they may be in. It can be any, anything from there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, they just don't know where they are, to where they wind up dying on you. Working to identify those who perished in the desert. The condition of his remains suggests to us that he probably lay out there for one to three months. And eavesdropping on a hummingbird's nest. I watch them from a long way away in my yard, but it's the views from the webcam have been really amazing. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. We're here on the U Arizona campus in front of the Arizona State Museum building. And as you can see, we continue to observe precautions, including wearing masks and practicing physical distancing. Arizona continues to be one of the nation's coronavirus hotspots, with daily cases increasing from 380 per day on May 20th to 3,049 per day one month later. Total number of cases increased in that time from just over 13,000 in mid-May to over 54,000 by mid-June. The biggest age group of positive COVID-19 test results in Arizona is now among those between the ages of 20 and 44 years old. And many cities and counties have enacted emergency measures to require face masks in public, including Maricopa, Pima, and Coconino counties. Arizona 360's Lorraine Rivera spoke with the mayors of two municipalities who are taking different approaches to imposing mask requirements. Arizona's rise in cases has come as the state increases testing, but so has the rate of positive test, as well as hospital bed and ventilator usage. This week, Pima County officials warned ICUs were nearing capacity. The county passed its own mask requirements, but in the town of Marana, Mayor Ed Honey says he has no plans to enforce the policy. We asked him about that decision. As the mayor of Marana, you could issue some sort of proclamation that would require wearing a face covering in public, and you've opted not to do that. I have, yes. And what's the reason behind that decision? Well, I think if people, uh, people have a certain amount of culpability on their own, uh, if you go to a public place, wear a mask. If you're in an area where you can separate or in a park or children playing in our splash pads or on our playground equipment, uh, they're not going to wear a mask. It's 106 degrees out there. Uh, I think mandating wearing a mask is not going to guarantee you that everybody's going to wear one. I think in asking people to uh, try to be on their best behavior and, and be cautious and careful of the health of others works better. At the Arizona-Mexico border, a surge in COVID-19 cases led the city of Nogales to require face coverings in public. While breaking its ordinance is considered a misdemeanor, Garino says it's unlikely a person would be cited. I spoke to the, fire, the police chief and the uh, deputy city manager and I said, I didn't want to go with citations. I wanted to go with education first. And even, and matter of fact, our police officers carry masks with them in case they find somebody that is in need of a mask and they cannot social distance, they, they'll uh, uh, give that person a mask. And for what I understand, on Sunday, the deputy city manager and some other people went out to businesses and, and said that 99.9% .9 of the people were wearing masks into the establishment. For more on this and other top news stories of the week, visit news.azpm.org. It might seem hard to believe, but they're coming. The monsoons, I mean. All Arizonans appreciate the spectacle and the life-giving water they bring. And for Pima County Sheriff's Deputy Jeremy Ramirez, the thunder, lightning, and rains of the monsoon is often a call to action. Water is relentless. It doesn't stop. It's a constant force. It won't let up. 
when I see storms like this, I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're cool and they're neat, but I think, what call am I gonna get now? My name is Deputy Jeremy Ramirez. I am a deputy with the Pima County Sheriff's Department. My current assignment is with the Search and Rescue Unit. There's seven deputies and a sergeant for all of Pima County for our Search and Rescue Unit. So once we get a major call working, there's just physically not enough of us. Uh, swift water, I think, is one of the most dangerous things that we do, but there's always a little bit of worry as far as what can happen because a lot of it's unknown. Even when you're there, you, you don't always know exactly what's going on with everything. Currently, we're going to head to the Tank Verde Falls area just to see if there's any water flowing, how much is flowing, and how many people might be out there right now uh, with the storms that are possibly looming to the east of us that might drain into the falls area. One of the search rescue deputies will take the lead and we'll try to call the scene to try to get first-hand information. I wanna know where the person is, if they're on what we can consider the, the near side or the far side of the stream, how much imminent danger they may be in. It can be any, anything from there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, they just don't know where they are, to where they wind up dying on you. That was a pretty intense call, just from the fact that how many people we had and the number of people that were in imminent danger of, of potentially dying. Behind the tree, you can't see, but the father actually has his four-year-old child on his shoulders. There's two individuals that we could not get to that night, and we had a team of Sarah members walking in, so we waited for first light. You can see it's pretty tough to find somebody. It's raining southeast of us right now, maybe down by Mescal area. I'm not really sure off along I-10. It might move up here, we'll see. So the first one we're going to is the landing zone and we'll look down, you can see the main falls and see if, if there's anybody down there and how much water's flowing. You guys going down or did you come back up or what? How is it down there? All right, cool guys, thank you. This is residual from a couple days ago even and it's still flowing pretty good. So if we do get another storm up a little bit higher, the ground is still relatively saturated. And then on top of that, depending on where it rains, there's been fires in the Catalinas and in the Rincons. That affects how fast and where the drainage and the runoff will go to as well. Depending on where it goes, we could have anywhere from an hour, we could have a couple of hours to half an hour to get people out of there. Personally, I'm not the greatest fan of the monsoons. I know we need the rain, I like the rain, I don't mind it. It's just work related. Sometimes the people that put themselves in positions they probably shouldn't even be in in the first place um, because they know the warnings, they hear the warnings every year. It's put out as public safety announcements. Uh, everybody talks about it, it, it seems so, but we still get the folks that still inevitably they either want to see the monsoons or they don't think it'll happen to them. It's the it won't happen to me syndrome or I know what I'm doing. I know my capabilities. I know my limits. We get that every year. I really do actually enjoy my job being the search and rescue deputy. I may not enjoy the monsoon season so much, but overall my, jo my job, I, I really do enjoy it. It was not what I planned to do. I have a degree in the sciences and that's what I plan to do, work for the Forest Service or something along those lines. And this opportunity came up and I took a job and here I am 18 and a half years later, still doing it. Some of the search rescue calls we get, they're challenges, they're, they're mysteries. Sometimes when there's a missing person, you can't, you honestly you don't know where they are. You have an idea of some things and some models that you follow with some lost person behavior and just some instinct and as well as your training. So that it keeps you going on it. Plus it's something different 
pretty much every day. It can be argued that last year at this time, the national conversation was not on race, politics, or public health. It was on immigration. And while the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision against President Trump's bid to end DACA made headlines, the plight of those attempting to enter the U.S. by making the dangerous journey across the desert is little reported. All too often, that journey leads to death. Producer Vanessa Barchfield brings us this 2020 Edward R. Murrow winning story about Tucsonans working to find and identify those who don't survive. Here is What Remains. We are at milepost seven on South Mission Road. Not far from Mission San Javier, not far from Tucson, we're not far from Saurita. And a human being disappeared here in the spot where we're standing. This is an individual who was found with no other personal effects, no clothing, no backpack nothing found on the Tohoto Odom Nation in August uh, of last year, 2018. The condition of his remains suggests to us that he probably lay out there for one to three months. Nancy was from Lima, Peru. She had two daughters who lived in New York. She hadn't seen them in years. She was getting extremely depressed. And when she lost her job in 2009, that was the last straw and she took off north. Nancy had dyed her hair white to look older so that she wouldn't be abused or raped during her journey. This is the humerus, the upper arm bone, that we can see on him. And one of the reasons we know he's a teenager is that that bone hadn't, hadn't fully fused. So there was cartilage between this part of the bone and the main part of the bone. So he could have gotten taller. She took buses all the way through Central America and Mexico. And then she joined up with a coyote, with a guide, and another group of other migrants. They crossed the international boundary pretty quickly on, on foot. And then they were met by a vehicle that drove them north. Border Patrol pulled up behind them. Everyone who could escape the van ran out into the desert, um, including Nancy. From there, she was just missing. And the family began what would be a years long process of trying to find out what happened. Right now, we don't know who he is. We have no leads to his identity. As soon as Nancy disappeared, the family actually flew out to this area and searched the desert themselves, interviewed witnesses. I met with them in a hotel off the side of I-10 and took a missing persons report, tried to go to report at police where they were turned away. They went to Border Patrol themselves. They visited consulates. We're hoping that his mother or his father or another family member eventually reaches out and tells us that he went missing. Not only is loss a uh, personal loss a tragedy, this limbo, this not knowing if they're alive or dead, and if they are dead, has, has the body been found but nobody has put two and two together? or are they still laying out there? Part of what we do here is to determine how somebody died, the manner of death, the cause of death, and then help law enforcement with identification. We now know that actually her remains were found in 2011, about three and a half miles north of here. It took, however, until 2017 for that cranium that was found to be identified as Nancy's. We've had a slow motion mass disaster played out over the last 19, 20 years. 
3,000 people have come into this office for a post-mortem examination. Some were bodies of people who died that day or the day before. Other people were just represented by a single sun-bleached bone. Of those 3,000, 2,000 have been identified as a specific individual, all from south of the U.S.-Mexico border. We're on the Tohoto Odom Nation, the San Javier District, and uh, we're working with Tohoto Odom Police Department on these two mock death scenes, if you will. That's at 6-4. One is a typical scatter of remains by animals of somebody who dies on the desert floor. And the other one's somebody who dies in a dry wash, and then their body decomposes, it skeletonizes, and then when the waters come, as we know they always will, some of the bones get washed downstream. This is kind of exposed, ready to be photographed, and then removed. We always like to talk to the law enforcement officers who are responsible for recovering these remains because we do very few recoveries. The Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner, very rarely do we send an anthropologist or a pathologist or an investigator out to a scene. So we're almost totally reliant on the skills of law enforcement officers. That's gonna indicate I've got two individuals. Am I gonna be able to see, you know, oh, well that other left tibia was found 100 yards from here. We want them to be as thorough as possible, which means not only covering the widest area that, that makes sense, but while you're in that area, pay close attention to bones that can turn the color of the sand. It's not very pleasant at times. Some of the sights are horrific. Some of the smells are horrific. Using your hands, gloved hands, on, on a decomposing body is an assault to <clears throat> several of your senses. These folks uh, live the hard life, and their, their skin and their teeth and their bones reflect these stressors that have accumulated. In this young man's case, he didn't live too long, but he still has some of these childhood stress marks written on his bones. Something that I observed about Bruce Anderson in the early 2000s, that he wrote by hand hundreds of missing persons reports. Families were calling him, and he didn't turn them away. It wasn't the right place. You know, a forensic anthropologist usually isn't taking missing persons reports. Usually you refer that to police. Bruce knew that they couldn't go to police. I started typing all of his handwritten missing persons reports into a database. One of them was for a Guatemalan woman. He had stapled a beautiful picture of her wearing traditional Guatemalan traje to his handwritten report. And in addition to her name and the date of disappearance and her age, he'd written on the margin a note that said, she was a nice person. And that stood out to me. It was the representation of someone who was not only collecting data as a scientist, but also listening to a family and being there with them in that moment of crisis. I know that my best day as a forensic anthropologist, gleaning some really important information, that can lead to an identification. That then becomes the worst day a mother or a wife could ever have because now we know this John Doe has been identified as, as their son or their husband. So I have to temper, I think most of us do, temper our satisfaction with ourselves of doing a good job by knowing that that's the outcome. Forensic anthropology can not only identify one individual person, but it can also show patterns across many cases. The genetic estimate of all living humans is that we're 99.9% .9 alike. In my job, I can do a better service 
if I can find some of those differences. There's a quote from Ruth Benedict that the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human difference. It's a very precise science that can come to interact with very deep human need for answers, for truth, and for justice. Most of the photos you saw in that story are of objects, including shoes, ID cards, and jewelry found alongside human remains in Arizona's border region. The photos are from a national database of missing and unidentified people. You can search the database online at namus.gov. That's N-A-M-U-S dot gov. What is herd immunity? How do we get there? Why is it important? We asked Michael Worraby, head of U Arizona's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, in this installment of Coronavirus Pandemic, what you need to know. People may have heard this term herd immunity, which is essentially the level of immunity in the population that prevents the virus from being able to find enough new susceptible hosts to, to survive in the population. For this virus, you're looking at something more than 50%, maybe 65, maybe even 70% of the population having been infected and achieving good immunity. And so you've got an easy way and a, and a hard way of achieving herd immunity. The hard way is if this virus just rolls through and infects that many people. The easy way is with a vaccine, and that's why if we could get a vaccine rolled out as soon as possible, we'll be in a, a, a great position. Five years ago, Justice Construction was wrapping up on this, the U of A's Environment and Natural Resources Building too. People began to take notice in a seemingly odd and precarious place. An annual spectacle was playing out right in front of our very eyes. While students were away for the summer, crews at the University of Arizona were hard at work putting the finishing touches on the new Environment and Natural Resources Building for the upcoming school year. Installing wireless internet was one of the final steps. When they were getting ready to install the wireless access points, and when they got over to this particular point, they thought it was like a little bag or something that was stuck on the end of their cable. It looked like maybe somebody put something there to protect it, but it looked like a dirty little bag. This is what one crew found hanging from the end of the cable. I didn't know what to think, to be honest with you. It's like, it's, so something we should take down and put the access point up? Should we keep it? So they weren't sure, so when they climbed up on the ladder, obviously they found that it was a nest with a couple uh, eggs in it. It turns out the nest was built by a black-chinned hummingbird. The eggs were still a few days away from hatching. Kent Ridgway sent an email asking what to do about it. Within a couple hours, there are emails flying back and forth, and like, hey, this would be really cool if we could uh, get a webcam up there so we can you know, watch the whole process. And um, brought it to my boss's attention. He's like, yeah, this is creating some buzz. We should definitely get a web webcam up there. In a matter of a couple days, you know, the UITS installed a camera. They got the feed over to our department, and our IT guys got it on our website, and we started kind of promoting it or letting people know. The 24-hour live feed of the webcam was up and running. It gave us all a view into an unfamiliar world. The bird actually on the webcam probably looks, eh, at least five times bigger. There are other hummingbird cameras, but I've heard this is one of the best views of a nest that a lot of people have seen. I've watched them from a long way away in my yard, but it's the views from the webcam have been really amazing. UA staff were some of the first people to start watching, and some watched a lot. It's been really difficult. I keep a browser up at all times with the, the camera so I can keep an eye on them. When I come out to use the restroom, I'll make sure I stop by so I can uh, see how they're doing. I posted it to Facebook and I have friends all over the world. You can tell I'm English and there are people who are completely obsessed. I've had texts from people at five in the morning who are worried about the hummingbirds. 
As the hummingbirds were born and started to grow, so did traffic on the webcam. The live feed was picked up by Wired magazine, but got the most traffic from a UA employee who posted it to Imager, an online image sharing site. At times, there were over a thousand people tuning in to watch at the same time. Wife, kids always want to see it. When they wake up in the morning, they want to see it. Family wants to see it. Work, you know, it's it's a uh, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. It's been great, but also worrying because nature can be pretty raw, and you're always worried. Oh, the eggs aren't going to hatch. The babies are going to fall out. Then you know something's going to happen. The nest was doing okay, and then it sort of started tilting a little bit, and then a little bit more, and we were getting phone calls apparently from across the country from folks who were uh, worried about the plight of the babies and that they might fall out of the nest. I think there'll actually be a bit of relief when they've both flown away, because we can all get on with our work. <laughs> Eventually, after some practice, one of the young birds got up enough courage to leave the nest. One reluctant fledgling remained. Its mother kept coming back and providing food while encouraging this little one to finally leave the nest. Leaving the nest. There's a lot of uh, link between that and all the parents that are going to be delivering their kids to U of A next week, because there's all these people leaving the nest next week. <laughs> This little bird is about to leave all it has ever known and faces an uncertain future. It is a dramatic moment. It's part of the cycle of life that happens millions of times every year all across the world, just not always dangling from a cable. A cable connected to modern technology that allowed over a quarter of a million people to watch this ancient process unfold. I think it's absolutely awesome that the hummingbirds decided to move in before anybody else did. I think it's significant and it's also very heartwarming because it's a building that's devoted to the environment, it's a building that is devoted to um, the science of the environment. In nature, you know, why did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I never thought in a million years you'd see something like that, you know. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week.